As is the case with most things in my life these days, this video idea came from TikTok. I got a comment on one of my videos talking about how glass is the only eco-friendly packaging alternative. And if you've been following me for a while, you know how I feel about that. If you know how I feel, why would you say that? Like you put me in such an uncomfortable situation. Like you know I'm not happy, you know I'm trying. So I made a TikTok kind of explaining why glass isn't the overall more sustainable option. And most of the comments were, but glass is more recyclable. And that's the good and bad thing about TikTok is that the information that you post may be presented to people who haven't been introduced to these like thoughts and ideas yet. Like my video could show up on the For You page of someone who literally their only idea of sustainability is recyclability which we're gonna get into. But the downside is you only got about 15 to 20 seconds of people's attention span on that app for them to listen to what you're actually saying. And you can't get into the nitty gritty of all that is sustainability in that short of a time period. Hence this video idea was born so that we could get more into the gray areas, the nitty gritty, the real true thoughts behind what sustainability actually even means. So let's start there with the myth being sustainable equals recyclable because in my opinion and as is backed up by data as well, this is simply not true. And I've been accused of being like paid out by big plastic or big oil and these sort of things for saying this. Um, but really it's just, uh, I'm a numbers person. I love a life cycle analysis. I love looking at the full picture of things. I don't like black and white thinking and that's where this idea comes from. But the idea that I've been paid off to say that glass is not the most eco-friendly option is laughable because in reality, us thinking that glass is the most sustainable option because it's recyclable is just a myth that's also been sold to you quite literally by giant corporations. Like the recycling campaigns back in the 70s and 80s that put all of the pressure on us to do the recycling, to take care of the waste. Yeah, that's propaganda that was put out there by corporations with very, very deep pockets, putting the responsibility of their waste onto our responsibility. And I think that propaganda and that idea coupled with the zero waste movement in the mid 2010s, uh, up until like 2020 really, discovering that glass is more recyclable than other materials. I think that's how the zero waste movement adapted this idea that glass is the most sustainable thing that we can buy as a packaging, right? That's what we're talking about. That's just simply not true. That is a myth. And when I say that, I feel like people think of all of the exceptions, right? Of course, a reuse system is going to be more sustainable than a single use system. But in the way that our economy and the way that like business currently operates in at least the Western world, we're talking single use packaging and mixed material recycling. And in that case, glass is very rarely the most sustainable choice. So under this umbrella of glass not being the most sustainable choice, I want to bust the myth that number one, sustainability equals recyclability because that's not true. And then kind of like a caveat under that myth is glass is the best option for single use material. So let's break down why that's not true and why just because something is recyclable doesn't make it the best option. Some of the issues with glass include number one, glass is made from sand if you didn't know. And currently we are running out of that sand. Running out of glass and then using glass as a primary single use packaging is not sustainable in like a literal term, not just like throwing around the word sustainability. It is impossible to sustain the demand for glass because we are running out. And extracting sand in the way that we do leaves shorelines and frontline communities at risk for flooding um, and especially really at risk for major weather events. And right now I'm speaking about sand and glass on a structural level, on a whole society system, if you will. There are exceptions to this rule and solutions that exist, which are amazing. If you haven't heard of Glass Half Full NOLA, it is ran by my TikTok friend, Fran, and she's an incredible human being who is recycling glass to make sand to restore coastal erosion. That idea, publicly funded and on a mass scale, could definitely help with this problem, but as a system currently stands, glass has its problems with the raw materials. And if you didn't know, as a caveat to that, only around 30% of glass in the US gets recycled anyway. I think plastic has been very demonized because they have an even lower percentage than that. And rightfully so, the recycling aspect of plastic needs to be dealt with, but as does it with glass. Worldwide, we go through 50 billion tons of sand every year, and that is twice the amount of sand that our rivers worldwide produce in a year. Again, the literal definition of unsustainable. 
Now, all of that is really concerning. Aside from that, the production glass takes a lot, a lot more energy to create and to recycle. One example of an LCA I've seen between glass and a plastic bottle is that the total impact of a glass bottle is around 245 grams of CO2, whereas the lighter plastic alternative is only 49 grams of CO2. Requires less energy to produce, therefore less greenhouse gas emissions. And same thing with shipping. Glass is a lot heavier and it takes more energy to transport, not to mention it's breakable and can be at a hazard for people who are dealing with it. So yeah, in response to that TikTok comment in a long drawn out way so that we can all learn together, myth I'm busting number one is that glass is the most sustainable option for packaging. It's simply not. And myth number two is that sustainability equals recyclability because all of the comments just kept saying, but glass is recyclable. And the whole point is that it's not that simple. So I'm just gonna tell you the reasons why choosing the most recyclable thing is not the best thing for the planet always. And again, I've been accused of being like paid to say this and that's why I'm saying it, when in reality, it, it, it's kind of the opposite. It was easy over the last few years to put like recyclable on your packaging and for that to seem sustainable. And those are the brands who a lot of times will pay me to talk about their product simply because it's in a recyclable container. Saying that that's not always the best option isn't the best thing for my bottom line, if I'm being honest. I think if we looked beyond just choosing the more sustainable packaging, we would see that the actual problem is the system and that's what we should be focusing focusing on, putting pressure on. So let's start this with the idea of our recycling system is fucked up. Like I said, less than 10% of plastics get recycled, around 30% of glass gets recycled, cardboard does okay, and metals is that pretty okay too. How often do I buy something from the grocery store that's in metal or that's in cardboard? It's not that common. Most things I'm buying from the grocery store are in plastic, sometimes glass, most of the time these days, a flexible mixed material. So if we look at all these packaging categories with the umbrella of our recycling system being fucked up, the likelihood of any of these materials getting recycled is actually quite low, especially with our flawed mixed material single stream recycling system. So personally, my thought process over the last couple years has been, if said packaging I'm buying is most likely statistically to to end up in a landfill, let me choose the packaging that is better in every other section of a life cycle analysis. So this means in terms of resources extracted from the planet, what that process looks like, the amount of materials that needs to be extracted because some packaging takes a lot less packaging to get the product to you nicely and like preserve it than others. How much energy does it take to produce that item? How much energy does it take to ship said item? And I take those things into consideration more than the recyclability because most likely with our current system, the thing that I am buying is going to end up in the landfill. And the whole idea here is to get more extended producer responsibility bills passed to make the people responsible for producing this waste responsible for making sure it actually gets recycled instead of trying to do our best in a system that is clearly broken. I just wanna shake everyone in my comments who's like, mm, but it's not recyclable. Damn, is anything? Is anything recyclable at this point? That's where I'm at with it. According to the numbers, the material that is best in each of these categories is usually a thin, flexible material. And we'll get more into the nitty gritty of why that might be in just a little bit. But in all the categories that I just listed, it wins. It requires the least amount of materials to be extracted from the earth because the mixed material, even the thinnest, thinnest layer is better at preserving food than the thickest of just plain plastics, just plain glass can. It's the lightest of all of the materials. So for shipping, it takes the least amount of fuel. It also takes significantly less water to produce. So other, again, raw materials to go into that packaging. So this is very much what the Flexible Packaging Association is working towards to get more of those extended producer responsibility bills in front of our legislators and get them enacted. And in 2021, a lot of them were introduced across many states. I'll leave a link below if I can remember so that you can go see which ones are in each state. Uh, some states are doing better than others and there have been rumors of a federal bill being introduced, but I haven't seen that actually come uh, live to the public yet.
But when we talk about waste and we're trying to be zero waste and we're trying to be more sustainable and all those sort of things, that's what I think we should be focusing on. And I know that not everyone can be an activist, obviously, like that's a full-time job in and of itself. But I think that just paying attention to what is going on in your local and state government when it comes to extended producer responsibility is the way that actually we can create a sustainable uh, system long term. So I don't know if this one is necessarily a myth or just a misunderstanding and an oversimplification of the world, but um, not all packaging is created equal. So for example, something that you package in say like a plastic container with an aluminum lid can't just be put into a plastic container, can't just be put into a glass container, depending on what it is and how long they need its shelf life to be. For example, cat food is one of the things that I talked to Carlos from Inval about about years ago on a podcast where he explained to me that you can't put cat food in a glass container. It simply will not last as long or preserve the taste and the freshness um, and just the material in general because light can get through glass. It cannot preserve food as well as those like thin flexible packaging can. So the idea that all these other things that are packaged a certain way could just be switched over to this other packaging that we think is more sustainable is not always the case. And it can result in more food waste, which is obviously a net negative for the environment. And in a world where nearly half of the food that we produce gets wasted, the extended shelf life is essential to reducing food waste. And food waste has a huge greenhouse gas footprint. So I think that using packaging that extends the shelf life of food, it just makes sense in this case. Food waste is a massive problem in the world at large, but in the US specifically, and flexible packaging can help solve that issue. So let me just read you some numbers. 40% of meat, fish, and poultry purchased gets thrown away. 51% of dairy and fruit purchase gets thrown away, and 44% of fresh veggies gets thrown away, and an overall two thirds of food is disposed of due to spoilage. And I think as people who care about the planet, it's important to take all of that into consideration when we're talking about how to create a sustainable society, how to choose more sustainable options, and how to advocate at the end of the day for more sustainable packaging and systems overall. But as you're fathoming that, here's a, another little caveat. Sometimes package free might not be the best option. Now I have gone to great lengths to organize my fridge, my pantry, my produce shelf, to store things in a way that makes it last longer when I buy it package free. I do my absolute best to make sure that the foods that I buy are not going bad sitting in my fridge, okay? And I think that a lot of people probably watching this video do the same thing. And by all means, if you buy package free food and you always get to it before it goes bad, God bless you. Okay, please continue to do so. I'm on the same page with you, but this is a very interesting thing to fathom. I, for the life of me, for so long, could not understand why do they wrap the good cucumbers, okay, always the good cucumbers, in plastic at the grocery store? Because I don't want just a normal cucumber anymore. I'm a Persian or an English cucumber girly now, and they're always in plastic. And I was like, why? Why can't we just not do that? The reason is because that packaging makes the food last longer. And I do have actual numbers to give you as to how wrapping food in flexible packaging can make it last longer, and it blew my mind. These studies found that by wrapping cheese in flexible packaging, it can make it go from lasting 190 days to 280 days. Grapes can go from lasting seven days to lasting up to 70 days. Different types of meat could go from lasting four days up to 30 days. Broccoli could go from lasting six days up to 20 days. It all just makes sense to me that likely doing that, using that packaging to make that food last longer, probably just in general has an overall positive impact in reducing food waste, which has a massive carbon footprint. Did you know that if food waste were its own country, it would be the third largest polluter in the world behind the US and China? Not to mention the damage that it does to our soil to just extract things from the ground, ship it all over the place, and then bury it in a hole in the ground. 
Food waste is a massive problem, and many experts have said that if we could fix our food waste problem, we would resolve so many huge environmental issues. And after realizing all these things, it really just shifts your perspective on what is sustainable and what is not, because we all think of package-free food as the most sustainable option, and maybe for you and me in our homes it works, but on a massive scale, when we're looking at the amount of food that is wasted by the average person, it makes more sense for them to have these things in packaging so that they have more time to get to them before it just ends up in a landfill anyway. And even me, right? I am technically a sustainability expert, went to school for environmental science, obsessed with life cycle analysis, but that doesn't mean I know the life cycle analysis of every single thing ever. And as more information comes out, I want to normalize changing my opinion as an environmentalist and very much the numbers that I've looked at in this video today to make this video. I definitely think that flexible packaging and like thin mixed materials, thin plastics, I think they've really been demonized and that a lot of people have not stopped to understand the reason that those things are there in the first place. But those are all to do with kind of recycling flexible packaging and then I had a few more myths that I wanna go through and I would love to make this sort of video a series if that's what you want, let me know in the comments down below. I realized that I, it kind of sounded like I was done with the video but I'm not, I have a few other things I wanted to talk about here and one of those things is becoming very popular to talk about recently, which is that BP created the concept of carbon footprint. So to me, what I've seen the narrative start to become on social media is that people are realizing that BP kind of came up with this concept of carbon footprint, right? And that somehow means that carbon footprints don't exist. I'm also interested to see your feedback on this because I do obviously think that BP has more of a responsibility to lower their carbon footprint and lower their overall environmental impact than I do as a person. And I think that overall, like emissions wise, there's a lot to be said for the people at the top to lower their foot carbon footprints rather than focusing on people like you and me. Like I'm all here for that narrative. But that doesn't then mean that like the carbon footprint of all the things we talked about today, different packagings and different like shipping materials, the carbon footprint of you and me, it, it doesn't mean that those things cease to exist. I love a good life cycle analysis and I really love to look at the full spectrum of the impact of any action or product or packaging that's out there. I think we should look at it from every aspect that makes up its entire environmental impact. And environmental impact in and of itself is basically environmental footprint that incorporates also the carbon footprint. And BP didn't create the environmental impact of any of my laptop, you know? They didn't create the carbon footprint of this laptop. The carbon footprint of this laptop still exists right now, as does its entire environmental impact, as does every uh, consulting firm that does assessment for businesses uh, to lower their environmental impact. So I think the idea of a carbon footprint really helps us conceptualize that there is more to something than just what you can see because a carbon footprint is invisible and the only way we would know what it is is if we measure it by its carbon footprint. Same thing with like virtual water, right? The amount of water it takes to make anything is still there even if we don't see it. And I think talking about water footprints and carbon footprints and overall environmental footprints is really important to conceptualize that sustainability is about more than, you know, recycling my laptop. So this myth I think is very much out there um, in a propaganda sort of way. I definitely think that people who have um, an interest in not solving climate change because it will not be as good for their bottom line has put up this idea that we need solutions to climate change. Like <laughs> the famously, Elon Musk tweeted out like, basically I'll give a bunch of money to whoever can figure out carbon capture. And I remember the reply to that that actually went viral that I saw was congratulations to whoever invented trees. This whole concept is basically that we need solutions to solving climate change and we need them now and we need to come up with them and all these sort of things, we need this technology, we need this, like all these concepts, when in reality, the solutions exist, okay? We already know what we need to do. We already know what we've done wrong. We just need to do it. We don't need to spend time and money and resources on coming up with new carbon capture ideas. We already know that emitting carbon is bad for the planet overall. Um, and we know what alternatives to emitting those carbon emissions are. 
renewables, nuclear, uh, creating uh, fuel from bio waste and all these sort of things. I just want to put that in here because I see that sometimes, like solutions to XYZ problem. There are already solutions to most major problems that we face in terms of the planet uh, and its overall health and sustainability. We, we don't need more solutions. We, we just need to implement the ones that exist. And to me, the biggest myth of the environmental movement of the sustainability space is that the responsibility to solve our environmental problems is all up to corporations, governments, or individuals. I think they're all myths. I think they're all wrong because I don't think the government has any motivation to implement changes that corporations have to make. I don't think corporations have any incentive to do that without the government. And I don't think the government has any incentive to change without us. For very much right now, for there to be a group of people who think it's not up to them, they have no responsibility, they're not gonna do anything. And over here, people who think that it's all up to them and individuals drive the market and they're the ones who have to do everything, there's very much two classes of people right now that want the same thing, but that are fighting because they can't agree which one matters more. And I don't think it matters at all which one matters more because it's all crucial to actually creating a sustainable society. And we've seen incredible movements over the last couple years, you guys, we've seen some incredible, incredible wins for the planet, especially the past recently of the Inflation Reduction Act. I'm incredibly excited for what that means for the US's target goals. To meet our promises that we made in the Paris Climate Agreement and then renewed again at the last two COPs. But at the end of the day, it's not even really an opinion that it is up to one or the other. And it's not even an opinion that it is up to all three. It is just a, simply a myth that it's up to only one of those three classes of people because it is up to all of us. Change will not come without it coming from all three of those uh, groups of people. So I'll leave you off with that today. Thank you so much for watching. And remember until next time, because of the context of this video, I'm going to say, do your best and advocate for the rest. Thanks guys.